please welcome to the stage the executive director of the Black Inventors Hall of Fame, James Howard. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the long-awaited inaugural Design Thinking Collegiate Challenge. Where we're going to present to you tonight are three amazing teams from three different schools who have tackled the entire semester wicked problems that disproportionately impact people of color. And these are problems that these students have delved deep into. And they're going to bring to you not only their insight, but just how thoughtful they were in applying empathy to each problem. So I'm not going to get too much into what they did, because they're going to come up and show you and demonstrate to you. However, what I would like to do is start off to nice festivities with a song. We're going to bring it to you from none other than Lady Shannon Wright, bringing to you Sam Cook's rendition of a change. It's going to come. <laughs> Shannon Wright. Good evening. When we pray, we pray as though we've already received it. So a change is going to come is now a change has come. Just like the river we've been running ever since. It's been a long, long time coming, and we know, yes, we know, the change has come. Oh, yes, it has. It's been too hard living, my Lord. We weren't afraid to die, cause we know what's up there, beyond the sky. It's been a long, long time coming, and we know, yes, we know, change has come. Ooh, yes, it has. We go. We go downtown. People keep on telling us, baby, don't hang around. It's been a long, long time coming, and we know, yes, we know the change has come. Oh, yes, it has. When we go to our brother and we say, Brother, brother, won't you help me please? But when we go to our brother, we wind up dropping down over. It's been a long, 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 long time coming, and we know, yes, we know, change has come. Oh, yes, it has. Thank you, Shannon. Coming to you all the way from the Windy City, Chicago. She sings so good, wouldn't you agree? Indeed, indeed. We're going to jump right to the competition right now, and what I'm about to do is bring to the stage our first presentation. 
brought to you by Megan and Simon, and they're going to bring to you an issue related to Justice Math, and their team is called the Design Thinking Collaborative. Megan and Simon. Please welcome to the stage the University of Tulsa and University of Colorado Boulder Design Thinking Collaborative. Good evening. I am Megan Ames, and this is Simon Julian, and we are part of the TUCU Design Collaborative. And this semester, we've been working on our project, Justice Math, which is a solution to inequities in mathematics based on race in the American education system. This is something we were inspired to work on after we learned that African-American students who perform on par with students of other races are not advanced at the same rate. So who I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process to get to our solution, and then Simon will pitch our solution to you. So to begin with, we are a group of seven undergraduate students from a variety of backgrounds. We have students studying English, mathematics, um, computer science, and art. And we took all of our strengths from those variety of subjects and put them to use to solve this problem together. We use the design thinking process, which has five simple steps. There's empathy, um, <laughs> definition, ideation, prototyping, and feedback. The beautiful thing about this design process is that it is iterative. So you can go back and revisit steps you need to in order to really refine your solution. I'm going to walk you through each step. First, empathy. For empathy, we decided to send out surveys to a wide range of uh, people who are students and graduates to see what their view of mathematics was. We also talked to experts in the area of mathematics and education to see how they saw the problem and what they could help us with in coming up with a solution. We then looked at the results of this data and summarized a few common themes. So the first thing you'll see here is that the age people begin to identify as not a math person is when they're in middle school. And they say that once they get into high school, that's the hardest experience they have with mathematics. Another recurring theme was the math culture surrounding them in their communities. If the community you're surrounded with is very negative about math and they think it's really hard or complicated or maybe not worth your time, then it's unlikely a student in that community is going to take an active interest in mathematics. The last issue that we looked at is that as you progress in the path of mathematics, classes and professors and teachers become less engaging with the material, which makes it hard for state students to stay interested and focused. With all of this in mind, we came up with one final empathy statement, which is African-American student achievement is, and promotion includes community, collaboration and systems, as well as personal math identity. This statement was a guidance for us to begin to narrow down a single definition of the problem. Um, we used two different methods to analyze that empathy statement and create a definition. One is the empathy mapping method, which figures out the way people experience a problem. They, we look at what they think, say, feel, and do about the problem and work from there to find a definition. Another method we used is the five whys method, which is where you ask why does the problem happen five different times until you can find a root cause for the problem. After we went through those steps, we were able to come up with a single definition of what we believed the root problem to be. This came to us in the form of a point of view, which is up here on the right, you'll see the African American community is comprised of complex and diverse people, resources, and assets that sometimes go unrecognized. So we wanted to come up with a solution that recognized those assets. When we moved into the process of ideation, we really focused on a single question, this how might we question that is on the bottom right. How might we amplify resources and assets within the community to support positive mathematics experiences for all? This guiding question led us into our brainstorming. We broke up into multiple different groups and 
made maps of as many ideas as we could think of. Some were very practical and some were wild, like what could you spend a billion dollars to solve this problem on? In that uh, step, we used a, after we did that step, we used a four letter system for voting on which ideas we felt were the best. There is an R vote for realistic, an F vote for favorite, an L vote for life altering, and a D vote for darling. After we voted, we decided to put multiple of our favorite and the best ideas together to come up with one cohesive solution. And I'm gonna let Simon tell you about that, that, about that in just a second. But first, I want to reiterate some of the big points that we had encountered up to this point in our project. So one of the first things we realized is that we had been problematizing the community instead of looking at what assets the community had that we could use to solve the problems together. Changing to a positive mindset instead of that negative mindset was a huge difference in creating a definition for the problem. We also looked at the fact that the African American community is not monolithic in their experience of mathematics. Everyone has their own way that they see and view math and we needed to meet people where they were. So our solution incorporated that. And now I will let Simon tell you what that solution was. Thanks, Megan. So math is hard. <laughs> Actually learning math can be somewhat of a traumatic experience. Um, I know I'm an engineer. I just graduated with my degree in, with a BS in engineering. And two weeks ago, <laughs> thank you. But two weeks ago, you could have caught me at my kitchen table nearly in tears studying for my final exam in my math class. <laughs> so let's take a poll. How many of you guys yourselves or have known people that have said, you know, I'm not a math person? Yeah, and you guys are all not alone. Today, actually, in the US, only about 7% of science, technology, engineering, or math are black um, career and work in the workforce. Um, but that being said, about twice as much of the money uh, or twice as much salary goes towards STEM jobs than the average career in the US. Over the past semester, our group has performed numerous interviews with industry professionals as well as actual students in the area to kind of come down to the root of this problem. And what we found is that with traditional math education, it's almost expected that a lot of the learning comes outside of the classroom. We also found that talking to the students, they kind of idolize um, entertainers and athletes more so than they do STEM jobs and careers. And they don't see that as a legitimate option for a stable or realistic career in their future lives. Um, so from this data, we kind of steered to a new and distinguishing direction. Um, and to pursue these students, we wanted to attack them um, in a good way, obviously. <laughs> And we wanted to, to focus on uh, personalizing a community in their areas, supporting them, and truly demonstrating to them that math is a lucrative industry, as well as something that they can achieve. Um, and so, skip you. So from this, we developed what we like to call our dynamic peer tutoring model. Um, and the premise of this allows students to be mentored and tutored by their own peers, first of all. And then second of all, it actually pays these students to be tutoring the age levels below them alongside with um, adult and professional support. Um, and with this strategy, this actually allows the process of learning math outside of the classroom. Um, it allows it to become more of a community-centered uh, experience and um, sorry, and also builds a positive attitude towards the math of their peers or towards learning math with their peers. And it builds confidence because they themselves as students are the mentors and are the leaders looked up to by their younger levels. Um, and ultimately they're gonna realize by getting paid and getting a small paycheck that math is a lucrative industry that they can accomplish. And it's the best way to so learn something if you teach it as everyone says. Um, so to harbor this community that we plan on constructing, we actually have also planned out a physical space. Um, so let's see if I can do this. On your guys' right side, on the top right, is a lower age group 
fun learning area that focuses on more fundamental learning blocks for math education. Um, on the lower right hand side is the math library. This would contain textbooks, but additionally, it would contain more interesting literature that would maybe build excitement and enthusiasm towards mathematics. In the center here is the makerspace. Um, and this would really allow students to experience and live the hands-on applications more on the technology, science, and engineering side of math and really see the scope of what the, this math can turn into. On the lower left-hand side, we have, um, or sorry, on the upper left-hand side, we have our professional development center. And in this center, we would bring in guest speakers. We would uh, help build professionalism and professional development within our students and really allow them to see what it, the future can become through mathematics. And in the center here is our multi-age help center where a lot of the dynamic tutoring between age groups would unfold. And then my favorite part um, on that wall behind is the relational imaging side. A lot of times with um, these students, they don't foresee STEM educators or STEM accomplishees as um, idols. And so we would be holding both uh, accomplished students in the program as well as real professionals that we want everyone to look up to and get their name out and notice. And they would all be hanging on the wall for us all to look up to in the program. So as of right now, we have developed a lot of interest through this TU tutoring center and are sifting through a lot of partial grant, uh, a lot of potential grant opportunities um, that are actually really excited about this opportunity. We're also in the midst of processing a lot of feedback that is also generally positive and we're constantly mixing and shifting the, our ideas through the design thinking process. Um, but we haven't done this alone. Um, so we would like to thank First of all, Director Howard and the Byhoff community um, for this opportunity. We'd also like to thank a lot of the professionals that we reached out to. Um, a lot of their faces are on here. They're, um, the Algebra Project, which is an amazing project, um, and a few others as well. Um, our friends, our family, my family traveled from Colorado to be up here today. And this has been a really rewarding process. Um, it's, we've been working all semester really hard. It's been a great group of people. And we're also really passionate and think that this is a really realistic solution that can enter a real impact on these students at all, a lot of age groups and particularly younger age groups. Um, so that is Justice Math and thank you and we'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Simon and Megan. Let's get one more round of applause for this lovely team. I was remiss in not acknowledging the professor that headed up this project and led the team, and that is Dr. Helen Douglas. She's from the Department of Education right here at Tulsa University. Dr. Douglas. Now this next young lady is flying solo tonight because she's a star. And that's not just because she's a star. That's actually her name, everyone, okay? And uh, she was joined by about four or five other students, but she's going to present tonight their presentation. And their team is called TU Trailblazers, and they worked on racialized medicine. Miss Star, the mic is yours. Please welcome to the stage the University of Tulsa Trailblazers. Hello everyone, can you hear me okay? Okay, well again, my name is Star and I'm representing the TU Trailblazers from the University of Tulsa. Uh, other members of my team include Grace Clark, Marissa Ramsey, Jasmine Johnson, and Liz Williams. And we are all led by our faculty mentor, Dr. Rachel Head from the sociology department. And the title of this research project was Exploring the Influence of a Formal Sociology Education on Empathy and Racial Beliefs Among Pre-Med Students. So we actually started with our empathy statement, which was that empathy is a crucial part of medicine and ensuring the well-being of our patients. 
This project sought to highlight the importance of a sociology education and building empathy for future doctors and better aligning the medical field with empathetic values and practices. So the, ooh, sorry, ooh, this wasn't, okay. So that's the empathy statement. And so our problem definition was racial disparities that exist in medicine. So racial disparities in medicine persist despite controlling for objective factors like income, education, and access to quality healthcare. And this is supported both by empirical evidence and research, as well as anecdotal evidence. For example, Serena Williams, do all of you know Serena Williams? So with her experience in, with racial disparities in medicine, that was just one example of how she's a famous tennis player and that didn't protect her from racial bias. So these racial disparities have been linked to racial bias among healthcare professionals. And the basis of this study actually came from a 2016 study that found for a lot of medical students and medical residents, there was the endorsement of false racial beliefs about biological differences between black people and white people. For example, the idea that black people feel less or no pain. And that actually directly translated to the provision of medical care. They were under-prescribed pain medication or prescribed lower quality pain medication. And so this racial bias has also been linked to reduced empathy. And that often translates to medical decisions that ultimately harm patients of color. And that is a problem, again, because race shouldn't dictate the quality of care that you receive. So the big ideas for this project were that we were establishing the relationship between a sociology education and empathy and establishing the relationship between a sociology education and the endorsement of false racial beliefs. So our mediating variable here was empathy. And we wanted to make students aware of structural determinants of health and prevent the endorsement of false racial beliefs and their application in medical decision-making. So the findings of this study, we conducted this study with IRB and internal review board approval. And this was conducted on University of Tulsa pre-med students. The surveys were conducted from all pre with a sample of all pre-med students uh, at the University of Tulsa. That was the sample that we drew from. And we drew from members of pre-health organizations at the University of Tulsa for our interviews. So the, oops, there's some formatting error, but the findings from our survey were, we actually confirmed what was found in the 2016 study for pre-med students, that there's a negative relationship between empathy and the endorsement of false racial beliefs. So those with higher empathy were less likely to endorse false racial beliefs. And we actually found that that trend existed for whether or not you took a sociology class. So empathy, we were able to define here as the biggest factor. So for our interviews, our interviews sort of were the meat of the study and they actually defined better what we found in our surveys. So according to the interview, pre-meds were much more likely to take courses that were requirements or that they felt would help with the MCAT. And as a pre-med myself, there are so many hoops to jump through. So of course the time will be spent on fulfilling requirements. So, and another finding of the interviews was that there was complexity in the way that the course is taught and that actually influenced what students ended up taking away from it. For example, with a course design of largely just readings and papers, students didn't take as much away in terms of social determinants of health versus those who had things like class discussion versus those who looked at a very broad range of topics and only touched a little bit on racism and racial disparities in medicine versus those who actually touched on more in-depth issues like that. So, this brought us to our proposed implementation. Our proposed implementation was either a course like the Sociology of Health, Illness and Medicine at the University of Tulsa that actually was more tailored to issues of racial disparities in medicine. So at the University of Tulsa, 
I took the sociology of health, illness, and medicine that was also taught by Dr. Head. And interestingly enough, I was the only pre-med in that class when I took it, which I did, wasn't too happy about because it's such an important thing to learn about for pre-med students. But I also wasn't that surprised because it was an upper level course. And as revealed also by the interviews, those who were trying to fulfill requirements, if they took a sociology course, they really just took the introductory sociology course. So it made it difficult to reach these more important and specific courses for medicine and health because you had to fulfill all of these prereqs for that class. And I was able to do it because sociology is one of my majors, but not everyone has two majors or a sociology major who is pre-med. And another implementation was to cover more of these issues in introductory sociology. So instead of just touching on racism like as a, a broad topic and like reading a chapter about it, actually doing activities about it and applying them to things like medicine. And in terms of teaching the students an empirical approach could help with students who are low on empathy and struggle to take perspectives, perspective of other people. An, an empirical approach could help them see that th this is the data and this is the conclusion and here is how we can apply it to becoming a future doctor and caring for our future patients. Another implementation was to make sociology a requirement. For a lot of med schools, it's not a requirement to take a sociology course and emphasizing how it can help in the MCAT. As a pre-med myself, I've heard from a lot of other pre-med students who are planning to take the MCAT, which is like the medical college's admissions test. They talk about just memorize all of the terms in the MCAT, uh, the Kaplan textbook, and you'll be fine. And that works for a lot of people, but it doesn't get to the issue of understanding social determinants of health. And finally, our next implementation was less abstraction in teaching these concepts, less memorization of terms and just memorizing these historical figures and actually getting into the specifics with experiential learning and things like a privilege walk. And for example, a privilege walk is where you have people lined up and you step forward, for example, if your parents are both college educated or if your family makes more than $100,000, then you step forward and see that difference in where you can start. So that led us to our example course design. So the course design was going to start with first an inventory so that students can know where they are. And the inventory would have similar questions to that asked in the survey. And the questions asked in the survey, we asked whether they took a sociology course or not, or whether they plan to. And in terms of measuring empathy, we gathered questions that measured empathy, things like I can relate that relate well to others, or it hurts me to see another person upset, things like that. And in terms of measuring the endorsement of false racial beliefs, we actually took also in the survey the statements used in the 2016 study. And it was a set of both false and true statements, and we didn't tell the students which one was which. And they were able to rank whether they found it true or not. And they ranked it from definitely untrue to definitely true. And something like that for this inventory could help students see where they are. And in, within the course itself, in addition to learning conceptual material and sociological, sociological concepts, students can use a combination of experiential learning, scenarios, and perspective taking. So things like role playing, for example, you're a doctor caring for your patient who doesn't have insurance or who works 40 hours a week and can't make it into the clinic Monday through Friday during the working times, or they don't have a car to actually make it to the clinic. So things like that and applying that to the medical field. And by the end of the course, maybe even in place of a final exam or paper, students would be able to take a re-inventory. So similar questions to the initial inventory, but being able to reflect on what they've learned throughout the course. So as a pre-med myself, I would definitely like to have a fun discussion at the end of the course instead of a final exam or paper. And so that would also be another thing attractive to pre-med students in taking a course like this. 
And as part of the final project, they would be involved in either a self-reflective video talking about what they learned or a discussion or a journal at the end of the course. And this project was a pilot study. We didn't have any funding for this pilot study, but we are applying for a grant this upcoming fall to further the study over a longer period of time with financial incentives for the pre-med students. So thank you, any questions? Thank you. Let's give one more round of applause for Star and the TU Trailblazers. This next group comes to you all the way from New Jersey, my hometown. And these three ladies, Carrie, Rebecca, and Cajune, represents themselves as the ladies of distinction. And they're gonna to bring to you a very unknown problem, but it will be revealed tonight. And that is human trafficking within the African American community. Ladies. Please welcome to the stage, the three ladies of distinction. everyone. We are the three ladies of distinction representing Berkeley College. My name is Rebecca Andrews Brennock. My name is Kajini Kamo. And my name is Carrie Broncano. And tonight we will be discussing the untold story of human sex trafficking amongst black females, which has disproportionately affected the black community. Here we have some statistics demonstrating how our black young girls are devalued. Approximately 50% of juvenile prostitution arrests are African Americans and about 40% of human trafficking victims are also African Americans. In a two year review of, hu of human trafficking incidents within, throughout the country, 94% were African American females 40% were just black, and 24% were Latinx. Researchers have concluded that the overall lack of representation and support that our black girls receive have contributed to their submission to, to sex trafficking. They are more likely to experience poverty and consequently more likely to be disconnected from schools and other community supports. While black girls are said to be overly supported within foster care, they are also structurally disadvantaged by systemic racial disparities within the foster care systems. This photo portrays common profiles frequently given to black women in our society. The angry black woman, the alcoholic, the drug addict. A study by the Center of Poverty and Inequality has shown that adults perceive black women, black girls, to be much more adult and knowledgeable about sex topics than their white girl counterparts. In DC schools, Black girls are over 20 times more likely to get suspended over a dress code violation over, white girl, uh, over their white girl counterparts. When compared to white girls of the same age, black girls are considered to be more knowledgeable about sex, more independent, need less nurturing, and to need less, less protection. This adultification is also present in our legal system. There is a racial bias that criminalizes black girls rather than seeing them as victims. Even the traffickers, the culprits, they believe that they will face a lesser penalty if they are caught trafficking black females over white females. We will now present to you a video, so if you could please direct your attention to the screens. 
I ended up running away and met a friend. We went to this house, which was like a drug house. She left me and said, I'll be right back. In that house was a male sitting on the couch right next to me. For the first time in my life, somebody asked me, was I okay? After the rapes, after the molestation, after all the bullying, somebody finally asked me, was I okay? I told that man my life story in 30 seconds. And he didn't have to come and look for me. Like he didn't have to come hunt like how normal traffickers do. I fell right on his doorstep. I was a kid in need. I needed shelter. I needed clothes. I needed food. And I was gonna need someone to take care of me because I was only 11 years old. And I just remember this look in his eye was just like this. I got her. And he started to groom me. And then that grooming process is he was preparing me to be trafficked. And I remember just freaking out in the back, like back seat, like scared. He got out, was yelling, why are you crying? And he hit me, I wanna just go home, I wanna go home. And he was just like, where are you gonna go? Nobody wants you. And I believe those lies. And he grabbed me by my hair and drugged me down the street. My knees were scraping the floor. It was other women out there. Nobody did anything. When you have been forced to sleep with seven to 15 men and be raped and be 11 years old, I was like slowly dying. And after the first night, you suppress those feelings because any inch of hope that you have, any sense of, I can get out, any feeling of there's a God, any feeling of I don't deserve this, you get beat. You ain't gonna survive out there. By the time I was 12 years old, within a year, I was already raped over 4,000 times. It took me to be four and a half years in the life until I was 15 years old for someone to finally step up and do something. And that was a man, his name is Jim Carson. And he was the first person in my life to tell me that I was a victim. It was never a choice. It's not a choice for these kids. Whether it was an influence, someone influenced them, whether it was somebody physically forced them into it. They're children whose dreams and innocence was stolen and snatched from them. Children who need someone to fight for them because they can't fight for themselves. Showing up when they don't expect you to. And saying, I care about you, I'm here for you, and I'm not giving up on you. We would like to propose the idea of inventing an app. The app will be called the 1591 app. It is discreet and safe for the young ladies out there that are sex traffic victims. As you can see, the icon for the app appears to look like a dove, but in fact, it is the hands gesture for sex traffic victims and also domestic abuse victims. Within this app, it will be divided into two sec sections. There will be a panic feature, so that way if they are in need of help, they can get the help that they need. The I need help function will not only have the panic button, but it would also have the traffic sex line, it will have the option to report a sex trafficker. It would also give the young ladies an option to locate, locate local shelters, organizations that can assist them, counseling services, and also housing opportunities and job assistance. The I want to help is for those who want to step up. It will have awareness training programs, workshops, also ways to volunteer at the local shelters and organizations. It will also have the most recent legislation for everyone to keep up to par on how they can help. Promoting 1591 will allow our black women and girls to know that they are loved, they are needed, and that they have the support that they desire. Bringing back that sense of family support is necessary as these young ladies feel that no one cares about them. We have to remind them that they are not for sale. A 
According to experts on the topic of human trafficking, the best solution is to stop it at its root. Our proposed solution is prevention through education. Our educational program will be called STEP, Sex Education, Sex Trafficking Education and Prevention. STEP will educate students, teachers, parents, church groups, youth groups, and so much more about how trafficking can be prevented and handled. STEP will use teaching materials that is relevant to the culture of the community. STEP will, utilize, STEP will utilize engaging activities that will demonstrate the luring process and the consequences associated with trafficking. Most importantly, STEP will, pro, will <clears throat> excuse me, STEP will respond with support rather than discipline. Our third, our third proposal is a campaign. To create this campaign, we will unify multiple sex trafficking focused organizations. And together we plan to combine funds and publicize the social injustice of sex trafficking through a social media centered campaign to bring awareness and initiate the want for change. This campaign will be called No Woman Left Behind. And our mission statement will be encouraging society to respond to this ongoing crisis of sex trafficking, predominantly affecting minorities. I can't make sure. Yeah, so. And we will, some of the organizations that we plan on teaming up with include New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, Black Girls Freedom Fund, and Free the Slaves. At this time, we will hear testimony about our app from a medical practitioner of 26 years in the medical field, followed by an NYPD officer of seven years who have both dealt firsthand with traffic victims. For their safety, we have altered their names. I'm kind of taken back because I don't know how you guys came up with an app, but that is amazing. Um, any resources that you can go and you can say, I need help. And then that same app can say, okay, we can help you find housing. We can help you find a job. We can help you find training. Cause a lot of the victims, not all are um, not educated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them will not reach out for help. So if you have something like that, that you can go to and feel safe secure and protected, that's phenomenal. I think your idea is hitting key points, actually, um, based on you know my response initially, um, education. It, it's getting people to a point where they can identify people who want to sex traffic you. Um, also, even add, to add to your idea, um, they have, there should be some type of panic button. Like, this guy is doing it. I need help with catching him. <laughs> you know what I mean? If there's something that we could implement even for that, uh, a, a direct line to a, a sex trafficking unit in the police department or local law enforcement that would raise red flags, you know? We would like to thank everyone that assisted us with our project. Um, Marie, Officer Cal, our advisor, Ms. Gaines, and Dr. Hargrove, who's not here today, but he's in here with us in spirit, as well as the many professors at Berkeley College who dedicated time to review our project. We are here today to use our voices for those who cannot be heard. Human sex trafficking within the black community has been overlooked due to the racial stigma that black girls are problematic. 
the remainder of society just assumes that they are not sex trafficked, that they are just runaways. And that's a problem that we need to fix. And with the help of society, we know that we can fix this problem. Thank you. Sequestered no more. Sequestered no more. This is an issue that should remain on the top of our minds from henceforth. In fact, all three of these problems are worth each and every one of us paying attention to. And if you see issues along the ones that they just brought forth, and if you see issues along anyone being treated unfairly while they're in college, attempting to earn medical degrees and math and so forth and so forth, step up, speak up. And that's the entire purpose of the design challenge, to allow the public to understand that when you apply big thinking, big things can happen. I appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to the three challenges. So what I want you to do right now, I'd like for all seven of the students to stand up and let's get one big round of applause for you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that moment, that long-awaited moment that we have all been waiting for, I'm going to let MC Janae reveal the winner. It is in this uh, brown uh, wrap here. I don't know who won. She don't know who won. But I can guarantee you one thing. By the time it takes her to take her fingernails and rip through this package, <laughs> we're going to all find out just who won. So, MC Janae, right, go right ahead. Here we go. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Hey, are y'all excited? It's like Christmas, but not for me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And our winners are... I'm just going to rip this off, y'all. <laughs> the Tulsa Trailblazers. Well, I just want to thank everyone for this opportunity, and I also want to thank Dr. Head for <laughs> letting me know about this. I don't have much to say, but thank you all. Thank you. This way, it's better. It gets better. On behalf of the Black Excellence Alliance, we're offering up in our inaugural Design Thinking Collegiate Challenge. First place honors to TU Trailblazers, University of Tulsa, acknowledging your team winning the inaugural BIHOF Design Thinking Collegiate Challenge 2021. Black Americans have a complicated history with America. We were sold and stolen from our homeland 
and brought here to build a brand new nation on our backs. Despite revisionist historians, the Civil War was fought over whether we were possessions or human beings. Once we received our freedom, for some, what that meant has always been up for debate. Reconstruction brought about opportunity that white supremacists have always tried to stop. Either through policy or by the way of the gun and a burning cross, we've had to fight for the prosperity that America has promised us all in the Constitution. But in spite of that, many of us have strived and prospered. Through leaders like Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey, W.B. Du Bois, Madam C.J. Walker, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, and others, we have proven that we have contributed to this nation despite the odds. Despite it being illegal for us to read for many years, our ancestors thrived in communities like the Greenwood District in Oklahoma in less than two generations after slavery's abolishment. But soon, policy gave way to destruction. While leaders such as Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer, Thurgood Marshall, John Lewis, and Barack Obama have led from the front, they've been supported by a community built on resilience, ingenuity, and determination. Today, we introduce you to the Black Excellence Alliance. We are a consortium of black leaders and organizations focused on the development of the black diaspora through education, employment, and entrepreneurship. Through our commitment to our economic independence, spiritual development, and community engagement, we will change the world. We believe it's time to recognize our past while creating our own future. We invite you to join us on this journey.